some 70 years ago, I was a student at Freed Hardeman. They had a program of where preacher students uh, addressed the student body on Wednesday night in the Wednesday night service. And fortunately or unfortunately, I had a friend who chose the speakers for those Wednesday night services. And about two weeks after school started, he asked me to speak. Well, I had spoken a number of times before uh, an audience, but not really, I didn't think, not really preached. So one Wednesday night, just after school started, I found myself standing in the pulpit at the Henderson Church of Christ and 400 people sitting out in front of me. I raised the question in my mind, what in the world is this country boy from Arkansas doing standing here? Because I looked over in one direction and I saw the president of the college. I looked over in another direction and I saw the head of the Bible department. I looked in another direction and I saw the head of the science department. And on and on it went with all of the faculty there, the older student leadership there, and here I was standing up here trying to teach them something. Well, it worked out all right. Here I am today, standing up before this audience, and there is in this audience a number of doctors lawyers, school teachers, and possibly firefighters, police officers, and a number of other important professions. And here I am, that country boy from Arkansas, standing up before you to try to teach you something. I kind of feel like the young man who was asked to make a speech before his uh, youth group and he'd never spoken to a group before he said to the audience or he tried when he got up before the audience he tried to speak opened his mouth and nothing came out he tried again nothing came out so finally he managed to say when I left home only God and I knew what I was going to say, and right now only God knows. <laughs> so I feel somewhat like that. I feel somewhat like that today. But I want to talk with you for just a few moments about something that is very important and particularly in our time. But let's look at a statement that Paul made in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 9. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, and he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. The part that I want to emphasize this morning is let us not be weary in well-doing. Many of us in this audience this morning are old enough to remember the Second World War. Maybe I should correct that <laughs> because many of us in this audience are not old enough to remember the Second World War. But my wife and I were born in the middle of the Depression, 1933. So we lived through the Second World War. We know how the country was united 
We know how the country produced the necessary products and services that were necessary in order for the war to function and for, uh, for this country to be successful. We understand that. We also know that we lived during the most prosperous years that this country has ever seen. So we have everything going our way and we are having some problems now. We are having, we are having some problems with uncontrolled borders, excessive government spending, and I don't mean to be political in mentioning these things, they're just matters of fact. We have many other problems that we are facing and will have to be resolved before this country gets back to its level of prosperity which it has enjoyed. Now, I read this passage of scripture in order to point out that even though we are enduring some difficulties, we cannot quit. We cannot give up. We cannot stop trying to bring back those times. And in fact, we are still enjoying a good bit of prosperity and enjoying a good bit of comfort. Oh, we have prophecies by some who are doomsayers. At least we hope that's what they are. I saw just uh, yesterday, I believe it was, uh, an indication that there may be food shortages, that there may be water shortages, and that there may be a number of things that we've been accustomed to that won't be present any longer, and we'll have to learn to uh, work around them, live without them, or at least in a reduced quantity. So we need to be, we need to understand that we do not need to quit. The Bible tells us very clearly, and we'll read a few passages in just a moment, that indicates that when we begin something, we should continue it. Now, how many of you have, how many of you have in the past, or maybe even right now, started a project and never did finish it? Maybe you didn't finish it because you got interrupted and just didn't get back to it. Maybe you didn't finish it because it cost too much and the cost was about to get out of hand, so you stopped it. Maybe you didn't finish it because you lost interest in it for one reason or another. There could be a thousand reasons why you didn't finish the project. How many of you have books lying around in your house that you started to read and you didn't finish. I remember some years ago, I started reading The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire. Well, that's kind of heavy reading. But I read almost all the way through the book. And then I laid it down and I never did finish it. And I've got one or two other books like that. I've read the biographies of some generals. And the biographies spent most of their time discussing battle tactics. Well, my mind doesn't, is not in attune with battle tactics. So after a while, I laid the book down and I didn't get back into it. So there are many reasons why we don't finish projects we start. During the Second World War, Germany began bombing London. And we're familiar with, uh, we're familiar with that bit of history. 
for some reason, and as far as I know, history does not tell us why Hitler stopped the buzz bomb attack on London. It just stopped. And so if he had kept it up, London would have fallen, but it didn't. That's one time when we are thankful that a project was not completed, was stopped. Now, sometimes in life, there are some projects that need to be stopped and they need to be left unfinished. But at the same time, most of the time, those projects should be completed. Let's do a little supposing. Let's suppose that Noah, when God approached him about building the ark, had looked at the plans, listened to God's instructions, and had gotten about halfway through the, the construction of that project. And he had said to God, I can't do this. I don't have the manpower. I don't have the tools. I don't have the materials. And I don't think I can get them. So I'm just going to stop where I am. And in addition to that, I don't think I can get all these animals together. What do you suppose would have been the result if he had stopped? But through his faith, he completed that project. All of the animals were put in the ark that was supposed to be there. And Noah and his family were the only ones who survived the flood. Now, if he had not completed that project, the chances are there would, be, it would have been no living creatures on the earth because he, like the other creatures, would have perished. Well, let's look at Abraham. God instructed Abraham to take his family and go from the area of the Chaldees into a place that he would be shown. He didn't know where he was going. And suppose his reaction would have been, God, I'm not going to a place when I don't know where I'm going. Now, we all have traveled in faith. We all have gotten on a plane and we were told that we were going to arrive in New York City, San Francisco, maybe Hawaii, maybe London. We've never been there before. So our faith in the people who arranged the details of that trip led us to get on that plane and to go where we intended to go. We've done that many times. Abraham did not know where he was going. And suppose he had said, Lord, I'm not going somewhere when I don't know where I'm going. That was not his attitude. His attitude was that he got up and went immediately. Now, if he, hadn't, if he hadn't gone as God instructed, then he would not have received the blessings of Genesis 12. His seed would not have become as many as the stars of the sky, as the sands of the seashore. And the result would have been that the Israelites would never have come into existence. The Messiah would never have come. So there were many consequences if he did not do what God asked him to do. If he had not finished the project which God gave him. 
Now, Moses was an individual quite all to himself. He was a man who had a very unusual beginning, came out of Egypt. God chose him and his brother Aaron to lead the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. Suppose when God approached Moses about going, about leading the children of Israel out of Egypt, suppose that Moses had said, and by the way, Moses used a number of excuses, and God answered every one of them. Suppose that Moses had been adamant and said, I'm not going to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, and they won't listen to me. Well, the Lord said, you don't, have to, you, don't, you don't have to worry about them not listening to you because I'm going to give you Aaron as your mouthpiece. And Aaron and Moses worked together. Suppose that when Moses and the children of Israel reached the Red Sea, they said, and it, they said when they reached there, Lord, we can't go any further. We can't swim across the Red Sea. We can't walk across the Red Sea, so we'll just stop right here. The Lord said, not so. I'll part the waters of the Red Sea, and you can walk through on dry land. And when they got on the other side, the Lord proved his point when Pharaoh's army pursued them into the depths of the Red Sea, and the Lord allowed the walls of the water to collapse over them, destroyed the Egyptian army. So if Moses had not completed his project, and by the way, after they crossed the Red Sea, the children of Israel were a rebellious people. And Moses had to listen to their complaints. If you had not brought us out into this, out into this wilderness, starved to death, to die of thirst, we could have stayed in Egypt and we would have, we would have lived. Moses listened to that over and over and over. And don't you know that listening to complaints all the time, one after another, never satisfied that Moses could have simply thrown up his hands and said, I give up, I quit. He didn't. He kept on. And there are several, uh, several incidents in Moses' uh, tenure as the leader of the, Egypt, uh, of the Israelites that he could, he could have done that. Well... Let's look at Joshua. Joshua comes to the River Jordan. He has been chosen to replace Moses. And he looks at the river and he looks at the sea, at the cities across the river, which have already been spied. And he says, We can't cross that river. We can't swim across it. We can't walk across it. We can't fly across it. And even if we get across the river, those cities on the other side are too strong for us. They have walls around them. And we can't possibly overcome them. We can't possibly possess the promised land. The Lord said, I'll help you. So he parted the waters of the Jordan River as he had the Red Sea. The children of Israel walked across the Jordan River on dry land. And as for the cities, God made it possible for the children of Israel to conquer those cities and to proceed with the project that God had set up for them. They did not shirk their responsibility, even though they complained about it. Well, there's... Joseph. 
Joseph is probably one of the most admirable characters of the Old Testament. Joseph was sold by his brothers, Midianite merchants, and they took him into slavery. He was favored and went into the house of Potiphar. Potiphar's wife was a wicked woman. She tried to seduce him. Well, let's suppose for just a moment that Joseph had yielded to her seduction. Well, I'm sure she was a beautiful woman, very desirable, very enticing, and very persuasive. But he did not. He, he finished his course. He said, if I, if I do this thing, then I will be sinning against God. The result was he was cast into prison. But evidently this was all of God's plan. Joseph spent some time in prison and then he came into the house of Pharaoh and then he became in charge. He came, became in charge of all of the food. In fact, it was second unto Pharaoh. He, became, he came in charge of all of the food and which resulted in the salvation of his own family from Canaan. He didn't quit. He, he kept on going. Then there's Job. Job is one of my favorite characters of the Old Testament. Job was a rich man. He had sons and daughters who were evidently prosperous also. But Satan came along. And Satan said to the Lord, or the Lord said to Satan, Have you tried my servant Job? He said, you can, you, you can do whatever you want to, just don't harm his body, spare his life. So what Satan did was take away all of his wealth, take away all of his family. And if you read the first chapter of Job, you'll find, that the, you'll find an, an enumeration of the flocks and the herds and the family that Job had. You'll find there a very rich man, a man comfortable in his living. And you'll also find a man tempted by Satan in much pain. So a little while later, later Satan comes back. And he and God have another conversation. And God says to Satan, you can do what you want to with Job to spare his life. So at that time, Job was smitten with boils from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head. Can you imagine how much pain that was, how much discomfort? I'm sure all of us have had at least one boil, and that's enough. In fact, it's one too many. But Job had those uh, sores from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head. And he had three, three friends. And they were telling him repeatedly that, Job, you must have done something wrong. You must have sinned. You must have done something that caused you to have all of these, uh, to have all of this discomfort. And then his wife chimed in with them and she said, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? That's a loving wife. Why don't you just curse God and die and get out of all of your pain and all of your suffering? He said, no, I will continue to serve God. He did. If you read the last two chapters of the book of Job, and particularly the last chapter, you will read about how God blessed him. 
because he did pursue. You will read about a man who had all of his wealth restored, uh, I believe, twofold. His children were restored. And he was a man who didn't give up. Then there's Daniel. You remember when Daniel was chosen to go into the house of the king, he and his two friends, that they were placed in a special uh, place to live and they were given special foods. And the foods were those that that Daniel didn't want to eat. He said, no, I, I won't eat those foods. And he said, you, you come back after a while and I'll show you the foods that I eat are better for me than the foods that you want me to eat. And he was right. A little bit later, he and his friends were cast into the hot furnace because they wouldn't worship the king. So Daniel says, I'll just go into the furnace, but I won't worship the king. And that he did. And the result was that the fires of the furnace did not touch him or his friends. God made that possible. He didn't quit. I'm not saying that everybody has to go into a fiery furnace in order, to, in order to pursue their service to God. But I am saying that we should never quit. Then finally, there's David. David was a man, was a shepherd, and his brothers were all encamped with Saul fighting the Philistines. And the result was that he came to the camp to check on his brothers and here was this giant across the valley challenging Israel every day to come out and fight. I can imagine what that giant said. speaking to the Israelites and telling them how weak they were, that they couldn't harm a flea, as we say sometimes. But David was asked to go fight that giant, or David said, I'll go fight that giant. And so they tried to give him Saul's armor. Saul's armor was so big that it swallowed him and it was too heavy for him to, to carry. So he threw it off and went down by the brook and picked up some stones and put them in his little pouch. And he walked over to meet this man and he said in, in these words, uh, how dare you defy the presence of God? God will fight for me. He threw his stone and it found its mark and it killed the giant. But suppose David had said, I'm not going across that brook to fight that man. He's twice as big as I am, twice as powerful as I am. Why should I risk my life going over there to fight him? David didn't have that attitude. But now if he had then the kingdom of Israel probably would never have come into existence. At least, uh, at least it would not have continued. That act on the part of David established his family as a dynasty. And as a dynasty, he was the one through whom the Messiah came. He was the one who made it possible for all of us here this morning to receive the forgiveness of our sins through Jesus Christ. 
We are privileged to be the recipients of David's determination to do what the Lord wanted him to do. Now, the passage which we read earlier this morning as a basis for our thoughts together, Galatians 6, 9, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. You and I are living in a time experiencing things and prosperity which few people on this earth have ever done. We, are, we have experienced good food, luxurious houses, automobiles. We have experienced families stayed together, families that loved each other. We have experienced a number of things that are excellent and that most people do not have an opportunity to experience. All because we didn't give up. We kept on working and we kept on trying. We kept on doing the things that were necessary in order to give us a good life and in order to make it possible for us to serve the Lord and to receive his blessings. In Matthew 24, 13, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. In Revelation 2 and verse 10, but thou be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. And then in Revelation, or rather Romans 2 and verse 7, to them who by natural, who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality. Have you begun a project? that you didn't finish? I'm wondering if there isn't someone in this audience this morning who has given some thought to obeying the gospel. You began that thought in your mind. You began that thought and you began studying. You began that thought and you began attending worship. You began that thought and you began being kinder to, to your family, to other people. You began that thought and you did some very serious consideration as to what you needed to do. Now my question to you this morning is, have you finished the project? Are you willing to receive the blessings that come from it? We're going to sing the song of invitation this morning. And if you want to complete that project this morning, be buried with your Lord in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Or if you want to ask God to forgive you of your sins, you started the project as a Christian and you have fallen out along the way and didn't finish. The opportunity is yours. Would you come while we stand together and sing?